In this video, I'm going to briefly introduce the hexapoda, or the insects. We have three learning goals. First, we want you to be able to distinguish hexapoda as a group within pancrustacea. Second, we want you to be familiar with the main lineages within hexapoda, including aspects of their ecological and or medical significance. And last, we want you to compare incomplete and complete metamorphosis in hexapoda. Recall that if you look at metazoan phylogeny, we are still within the group called the protostomes, which means that they have a blastopore that develops into the mouth. Now, although we identify a feature of protostomes as spiral mosaic cleavage, hexapods are among the groups that don't do spiral mosaic cleavage. They do their own thing, and we're not really going to talk about it in Biz 2C. If we zoom in on protostome phylogeny, we can see that hexapods are part of the arthropods, which are in ecdysozoa. So all hexapods shed or molt an external skeleton. If we think of ecdysozoa as a whole, there are two groups which we spend most of our time talking about. The nematodes, which we cover briefly, and the panarthropoda. Panarthropoda is the most diverse group of animals in the tree of life. Again, there are innumerable body forms, life histories, and ecology. This represents the bulk of animal diversity. And in this video, we're going to focus specifically on the hexapods. If we look more closely at the phylogeny of panarthropoda, we can see that the hexapods, which are defined by this red node here, are part of the pancrustacea. We spent some time talking about pancrustacea in a previous video where we briefly talk about melacostricans or crabs, shrimps, and lobsters, and we introduce hexapods. In this video, we're going to dig a little bit deeper into the hexapods given their diversity. Pancrustacea is the most diverse group on the tree of life, and there are three groups that we talk about in Biz2C. The melacostricans, or crabs, shrimp, and lobsters, the cirripedes, or the barnacles, and then the hexapods. This video is focused exclusively on the hexapods. Hexapods include at least 850,000 described species. As such, you can think of them as the sort of do-it-all animal group. There are terrestrial and aquatic forms, both freshwater and marine, and they do pretty much every kind of conceivable ecological role. Predators, parasites, even things like parasitoids, which kill their hosts. They have three tegmata, a head, thorax, and an abdomen. Again, tagmata refer to the fusion of an ancestrally more segmented animal. There's one pair of antennae, three pairs of legs, and if wings are present, there are one or two pairs of wings. If there's one pair of wings, then usually the wings have been modified in some way. So for example, the four wings of beetles have been modified into hardened plates, the hind wings of flies have been modified into counterbalances called hull tiers. Either way, ancestrally, insects had two pairs of wings. If we look at the pie chart on the lower right, this pie chart represents animal diversity, and we can see that hexapods, once again, occupy the vast majority of animal diversity on the tree of life. The first group of insects that we'll mention are the Intignatha. Now, Intignatha is likely a paraphyletic group. There's been lots of research done to figure out relationships of Intignaths to other insects. These are uh, insects that are wingless. They're typically small and kind of obscure. They live in uh, moist microenvironments like soil, leaf litter, and caves. As such, they have a reduced respiratory system. Many of them are blind, although springtails are an exception, and they have internal mouth parts. Intignatha 
refers to the fact that their mouth parts are actually internalized. Deplurins and proturins are pretty exclusive to caves, deep soil environments, but Columbula can be found on the surface. You should notice that they have eyes, whereas deplurins and proturins typically do not. Any discussion of insects should involve some kind of thinking about flight. The first thing to realize is that flight is not homologous among animals. It's evolved multiple times independently. Within insects, it's evolved only one time, so it is homologous. However, it's important to note that insects have lost flight multiple times. So for example, there are flightless beetles flightless flies, and flightless lepidopterans, etc. Either way, if you were to compare closely the morphology of wings among metazoans, you could clearly see that, for example, the wings of bats or birds are distinct from insects, so we still consider it a synapomorphy of a subgroup of insects. But remember, not all, because intignaths don't have wings. Winged insects can be broken down into two groups. The first group is the group we're going to discuss over the next few slides. Those are the Paleoptera. Paleoptera can fold their wings vertically. They can't fold their wings horizontally. So we distinguish Paleoptera from Neoptera by the way they fold their wings, among other things, such as the way the wings develop, but we're not going to discuss that in bis 2 c the first group of Paleopterans are the mayflies, or Themeroptera. They have two pairs of wings. Again, they can't be folded horizontally. They have aquatic larvae. So the larvae are here, and they look pretty different than the adults. But remember, no larval form has wings, so they can't fly, nor, the, nor can they reproduce. After some time as a larval form, even up to a year, they will molt into an adult stage, and this adult stage is both winged and reproductive. Now, in most cases, Ephemeroptera don't feed as adults. They emerge pretty much at the same time, and classic kind of examples where in the South, you can see that they almost form a big mass or nuisance in some areas because of their numbers, but this flight flighted form and reproductive form may only last a few hours before they die. So mayflies emerge as adults only for a very brief period. They spend most of their time as an aquatic larva. The second group within Paleoptera are the Odonata. This includes dragonflies and damselflies. Given that the adults are longer lived, Odonata have an extensive fossil record, and some of the extinct forms are among the largest ever known flying insects. Some extinct forms of Odonata have a wingspan of 71 centimeters, so they're absolutely huge. They have a predaceous lifestyle, and because their larvae are aquatic, they form an important part of stream ecology. Stream quality is often measured by the abundance of and diversity of invertebrates in the stream, and Odonata, because they can be readily identified, are part of this. Dragonflies are easy to distinguish from damselflies by the way they fold their wings. In most cases, dragonflies don't fold their wings. They keep them out. But damselflies do fold their wings above their body. The second group of insects that we'll talk about are the Neoptera, and this includes the bulk of insect diversity. So all the flies and butterflies and beetles, etc., that you know, all belong to the Neoptera. The first group of Neoptera that I'll discuss are those insects that have incomplete metamorphosis. Now this is a likely a paraphyletic group, and they're characterized by having a life cycle in which there are numerous stages or nymphal stages that look a lot like the adult stage. So there is an egg, a nymph, 
and an adult. Again, there's lots of nymphal stages. They all look like the adult and feed on the same thing, but they don't have wings and they're not reproductive. One of the classic groups that have incomplete metamorphosis are the orthopterans. This includes the grasshoppers, crickets, mole crickets, and katydids. Their mouth parts are modified for chewing, and there's at least 20,000 described species. Among the things that they're most famous for is stridulation. So these insects usually rub together two different appendages that have modifications on them to produce species-specific songs. Everybody's probably pretty familiar with the songs of crickets or grasshoppers and katydids, which can be quite loud. And again, they are species specific, oftentimes calling to mates or establishing territory. The second group we'll talk about with incomplete metamorphosis are the hemiptera. This includes insects like cicadas, stink bugs, aphids, assassin bugs, it also includes parasites like lice and bedbugs. Although you may be most familiar with some of these insects like cicadas and aphids, they occupy a wide range of ecological niches. They can be herbivores, predators, parasites, and some are important vectors of human diseases. Human diseases like Chagas disease for example, are often spread by assassin bugs. Keep in mind that many of these insects are also important vectors of plant diseases. Things like aphids and stink bugs readily transmit different plant viruses. Lastly, bed bugs and lice are important human parasites. The next group of insects represents the bulk of insect diversity. And these are the insects that have complete metamorphosis. They're oftentimes referred to as holometabolous. In holometabolous insects, the adults look very different from the juvenile stages. So the adults are also winged and reproductive, just like an incomplete metamorphosis. But once the egg hatches, it hatches into a larvae. And the larva usually feeds on completely different food items than the adult. Just like in incomplete metamorphosis, the larvae don't have wings and they're non-reproductive, but again, they're visually very different and ecologically fulfill a different role. As after several molts, what happens is the larvae will transform itself into a pupa. Inside the pupa, the body will undergo a remarkable transformation, and when it emerges, it has wings and is fully reproductive. This is the life cycle of the majority of insects that you know, including flies, beetles, wasps, butterflies, and moths. If we look more closely at the insect groups that do complete metamorphosis, they're oftentimes referred to as the holometabola, it includes about 85% of all described insect species. As such, they have a remarkably diverse ecology, which includes herbivores, predators, parasites, and parasitoids. They're super important, both as pollinators and pests, and some of them have medical significance. Think, for example, that mosquitoes are part of diptera, or flies, and transmit malaria. The Lepidopterans are a remarkable group of hexapods. It includes the butterflies and moths with about 175,000 described species. Many of them have highly specialized and diverse lifestyles and are important as pests and pollinators. Recall from our previous discussions that they oftentimes form important coevolutionary relationships with plants. Many angiosperms, for example, are pollinated by a single species of butterfly or moth. What you may not know is that many Lepidopterans sequester defensive chemicals from host plants. So Lepidopterans like the monarch butterfly, which feed on milkweeds, 
will sequester noxious chemicals from the milkweed to make them distasteful to predators. Although viceroys look a lot like monarchs, they don't feed on milkweeds and they are not noxious. So this is an example of mimicry, which is really common among insects. Adults are not the only stage that does this, so oftentimes larvae will do it as well. This larva on the right is sort of advertising itself as a predator or some kind of scary other animal by having big eye spots, and it also has a series of defensive spines, many of which will release a toxin if the caterpillar is predated. The beetles are the most diverse insect lineage. Estimates are between 250 to 300,000 species, many of which are undescribed. Although ancestrally insects have four wings, one of the interesting things about beetles is that they have a forewing, which has been modified into a protective shield. That protective shield is called an elytra. So in order for a beetle to fly, it has to first open up its elytra to expose its wings. Keep in mind that beetles are examples of insects that do complete metamorphosis. So, so there is a larval stage. The beetle in the middle here, which is the goliath beetle, which is the largest beetle on earth, also has a larval stage. You can see down below that the larval stage can be quite massive. As the larva develops, it will eventually pupate as well and emerge as the winged reproductive adult form. Diptera, or the flies, includes about 150,000 described species. Now, unlike the beetles, their forewings are not modified. Instead, they've modified the hind wing into counterweights called haltiers. If you look closely at this fly, you can see the haltier sticking out here. Given their diversity, their ecological strategies are super varied. They can be herbivores, predators, parasites, etc., and many of them have medical significance. Recall that mosquitoes are flies and they transmit malaria, but there are many other examples. Some of the extreme examples include things like bot flies, which can be ectoparasites on all kinds of different mammals, including humans. Remember, flies, like other insects that have complete metamorphosis, have a distinct larval stage. Bot flies oftentimes parasitize humans, especially in areas where cattle growing is common. And here is a larva sticking part of its body out of a human scalp. Last are the Hymenoptera, which includes at least 130,000 described species. This includes bees, wasps, and ants. Unlike beetles or flies, their wings are connected by hooks called hamuli. In this close-up image, you can see the hooks or hamuli that connect the wings. Hymenoptera females have an ovipositor that's been modified into a sting. So the males don't sting, but the females do. They can be really important pollinators in agriculture. Bees, again, are Hymenoptera, so they're extremely beneficial to human society. They're also known for sociality. So in many Hymenoptera, like the ants and the bees, we have a division of labor whereby all of the individual workers give up the ability to reproduce. And instead, the queen is the only reproductive individual. They also have some remarkable life histories, including parasitoids. Parasitoids are sort of like parasites and that they seek out specific hosts, but instead of merely infecting the host, they actually end up killing it. So a parasitoid will deposit an egg inside a host, the egg will emerge, and the larva will feed on that host until it emerges as the adult form.